So much has changed since last Easter. The world has been shaken. Life has been disrupted. What we once called normal seems like it may never return. It's been easy to be discouraged, to lose hope, to feel the foundations of our faith begin to crumble. It's hard to keep our feet planted when the ground beneath feels like shifting sand. Now more than ever, we need to stand on the truth of Easter, a day which changed our eternity, changed our world forever. Death was defeated by life. Sin was consumed by mercy. The grave was swallowed up by victory. See, even in the darkest of moments, the love of Jesus could not be stopped. His faithfulness could not be broken. And when the dust settled, Jesus, he stood alive and victorious. Today, may we remember the truth of Easter, the power of the resurrection, and the promise of eternity. Yes, the world has been shaken, but the grave, it's still empty. And Jesus, he's still risen. I greet you all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. My name is Daniel Kaozi, and I am excited about today's program. If you have been watching our church online service for some time, I say welcome back. But if this is your first time to join us, let me tell you, you are welcome. Thank you so much for connecting with us today. Please make yourself at home. You can actually take your shoes off and relax. We are about to have a great time with the Holy Spirit. Surely, today's service will be a great blessing to you and your family. But before we start, let us pray. Father, thank you for being so good and kind to us. We believe that this is the day you have made for us and we are going to rejoice and be glad in it. Father, I pray that your presence will saturate every home that is watching this online program. Let your mighty presence drive the enemy out of our houses, out of our apartment, out of our homes. Let your spirit break every chain and set our families completely free. We declare that from today, our homes and families will never be the same. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we say, Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Church, let us praise and worship God now. And then we'll hear a powerful message that God has given to his servant. At the end of this message, I'll come back and pray with you. Please don't go anywhere. I'll see you soon. Good morning, faith builders. Let's worship the King of Kings this morning. He is worthy to be praised. Risen. He's risen, forever glorified. Risen, He's risen, King Jesus, King Jesus is alive. Come on, church, let's put our hands together and worship our King of Kings. He is worthy of all our praise. Amen. We sing hallelujah to the King of Kings.
Jesus from the dead is the same power that lives in us that we can call on and worship and pray. Hallelujah. We thank you, God. The same power, yes. The same power. The same power that crushed the enemy. The same power. The same power. The same power.
few moments just thanking the Lord for King Jesus is alive. We sing praises unto you, Father. You are worthy of all our praise today. Revelations chapter 4 says, Holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come.
and raising from the dead, giving us victory, God. We just praise you and we worship you, God. We sing hallelujah because you're worthy of it all, God. With everything I am, God, we sing hallelujah. Thank you for joining us in worship this morning, Faith Builder family. God bless you. Have a wonderful Resurrection Sunday. But after he had considered these things, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because what has been conceived in her is by the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Faith Builders, we've just gone through what is known as Passion Week, or as some of us know it as Holy Week, the holiest of weeks in the year. Today, however, is a fabulous day because today is Resurrection Sunday. And all throughout the world, Christians are celebrating the resurrection of our Savior. This resurrection has great meaning for us all. Today is a day of reflection a day of recommitting our lives and a day of embracing God's grace through his son, Jesus Christ. Together, we read out of the Gospel of Matthew. I will admit this is a very unusual passage to read from, especially because we are celebrating the resurrection of Jesus and not paying too much attention to his birth, but it is timely and it is necessary. Maybe you've never looked at the possibility that this event might not have happened unless God had intervened. Upon knowing this, the meaning of the resurrection becomes that much more important to us. But today, I want to preach to you this morning on the topic, the dilemma, the gift, and the salvation that it is offered. The story of Jesus from his birth to his death as one that is centered around one truth, that our heavenly Father God sent his only begotten Son to save our lives from eternal damnation. Now, let me begin my sermon by giving you some insight to how we need to read Scripture. When we read Scripture, there are two ways that we must evaluate each passage of the Scripture that we read. They are in an indicative point of view or an imperative point of view. When a passage of scripture is relatable, it tells us that the writer wrote it with the intentions to be from an indicative point of view. When a passage of scripture is a command given by one in authority, in this case given by God, it is then coming from an imperative point of view. So when we read together the passage in the Gospel of Matthew, we can identify with Joseph's struggle Therefore, it was written in an indicative point of view. We can feel the emotions of what Joseph had been going through. You see, he finds his world turned upside down. The girl he's about to marry is now pregnant and by all indications, not by him. He is forced then to consider tearing up the agreement made between himself and Mary's father. But he knows that will only mean death by stoning of her if he decides on walking away from his wedding. Joseph has to now make a decision in which all alternatives are undesirable. He is in a dilemma. Now I had said earlier that this passage of scripture is relatable because we ourselves have found ourselves in many dilemmas in our lifetime, some not by our choosing, in fact, some people today who are watching find themselves in one now. 
People face all sorts of dilemmas, right? There are moral and ethical dilemmas. There are social and educational dilemmas. There's work and home dilemmas. The list goes on and on and on. The biggest challenge of a dilemma is that it does not offer a solution that would comply with the norm. So it shakes us and it leaves us destitute on the, on the shores of, of uncertainty. Now, throughout the history of humanity, people always face dilemmas. And so philosophers aimed and worked to find solutions to those problems. What dilemmas do bring, however, are challenges that can become too overwhelming to be faced alone. Therefore, we are in need of someone who can help us. Now, you can choose to make decisions on your own and try to make the right steps towards the right solutions. But I can guarantee it that it will be tiresome, it will be a tiresome task due to not knowing the end result. Now, uh, now enters God. Now, God will intervene on your behalf if only you will allow him to because he does know the end. It is here that we come to the portion of the scripture where God is intervening in Joseph's dilemma. We read today where the angel of God said something so significant, but yet we easily miss it unless we, like today, we pause for a moment and we begin to examine it. The angel of the Lord said to Joseph, you shall name him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. In other words, God was making the decision for Joseph. You shall. Now, I don't want to get off track here, but it is important to mention that it was the obligation of the father to name his children, though in some cases a mother would do so. But in the but the indication here was that Joseph was going to be directed to follow through with the marriage because there was something greater here, far beyond his personal feelings and his ego. What was at stake was a nation that was going to be in need or that was in need. What is at stake was that all of humanity from one generation to the next was in need of a savior. What was at stake was a message of a father's love for his creation. The world had rebelled and become rebellious. The father was about to offer something to correct it. You shall name him Jesus, Yeshua. His name shall be called Savior. Savior. <laughs> a Savior is a person who saves someone or something, especially a nation or a cause, from danger. So what sort of danger could humanity be in that they would need someone to save them? The Savior we speak about this morning is the ultimate gift given by the Father. Jesus is the answer to every dilemma. Whatever sort of problem that doesn't have a normal answer for it, Jesus, our gift, given by our Heavenly Father, is the answer that covers it all. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. So reading scripture and researching, we know that the danger that the Israelites faced during Jesus's timeline, but let's kind of fast forward it to April 4th, 2021. What dangers, what threats are you having to face today? What agony and disappointments are you losing sleep over? Dear friends, you've been given a gift. You have a savior. His name is Jesus. Looking back to our morning scripture, I'm intrigued of the word choice here in verse 21 that is used. His people. Jesus had to possess humanity in order to be the savior. That means he had to become human to become the ultimate sacrifice. He had to become flesh to take on to himself the sins of mankind. He made himself like us in the flesh in order for us to be adopted by the Father. We are his people. The gospel tells us that Jesus will save us. He will save us from our problems. He will save us from our trials. He will save us from ourselves and especially from our dilemmas. He will do this because he is the ultimate gift. John 3.16 states, For God so loved the world 
that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him shall not be lost, but should have eternal life. Now Luke 15 tells us of a parable of the prodigal son who left his father in household to go about his way. Now, while he was away, he wasted everything that had been given to him by his dad. He found himself in a dilemma. So he decided to return home, expecting to be ridiculed or to be chastised for his rebellion. He is then greeted with love and he's greeted with kindness. And the words of the father is echoed aloud. Quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Then bring the fattened calf and slaughter it and let's celebrate with the feast. Because this son of mine was dead and he's alive again. He was lost and he has been found. Hallelujah. Any sort of dilemma, faith builder, the answer is in the gift called Jesus. He brings salvation to the world. Now, this brings up a great question. What is it that I need to be saved from? What if I were to say to you, you need to be saved from a fallen world, a world that is corrupt, far from the perfection it had once been created to be? What if I were to say to you that you need to be saved from hell and its damnation? You see, hell in the Bible is a place of future punishment and the final destination for all who never believed in Jesus Christ and made him Lord over them. It is described in the scripture using various terms such as eternal fire, outer darkness, a place of weeping and torment, terms like the lake of fire, the second death, and the unquenchable fire. The gift of Jesus brings with it salvation. Salvation is yours and for everyone. All anyone has to do is to believe. Acts 16, 31 states it this way. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You and your household. You see, salvation is a gift from God. And when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you are saved from the penalty of hell. You see, imposed on you because of your rebellion and you then are granted eternal life because you chose to believe. Now, how can this be possible, you might ask? Because Jesus was willing to take on the cross out of sheer love for you and for me. We now fast forward 33 years into Jesus' life. And we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and verse 4. And it reads, For I passed on to you as most important what I also received, that Jesus Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Jesus died on the cross to show us what love truly looks like in action. God is love. And the most important lesson that Jesus teaches us is that when we act in an unloving way, we are literally distancing ourselves from God the Father. When asking yourself if something you do would be considered a sin, you should ask yourself if the action comes from a place of love. If it doesn't, then it's pulling you further away from living like Jesus. Sin is what takes us further away from God, and those actions are definitely void of love. The way Jesus led his life here on earth he was able to show great examples of what love looks like, from feeding those who were hungry to befriend, befriending those who were cast out by society. Jesus went above and beyond to help those that needed it the most. He offered them love and hope when no one else would. His life was a perfect example of what love and action could do for others. 
You see, Jesus dying on the cross was a sacrifice that he made for you and for me. And him doing so gives us the opportunity to ask for forgiveness for our sins. And then we are given the privilege of the opportunity to enter into heaven. We only have a pathway to heaven because of the loving sacrifice that Jesus made for the world. We are still responsible for what sins we commit. But by turning to Jesus, we now have to take that, we have that way now to take the weight off of our shoulders. Jesus did die to save us from our sins. But it wasn't a moment that wiped us clean from all responsibility. Instead, the Bible says that Jesus came to take away our sins so that we would no longer be sinners. Jesus' death showed us just how amazing God's love is for us. He gave us an opportunity to escape the evils of the world and be reunited with the Father in heaven. Jesus' death paved that avenue for us, but he is not in the grave as some would suggest. He is alive. His sacrifice, dear faith builder, gives us the road to eternal life. All you have to do today is accept his death on the old rugged cross. He took your place and my place there. Our sins are nailed to that cross. When Jesus was placed into the tomb, the devil thought he had finally won, giving God the Father the ultimate blow. What Jesus did during those days in the tomb was to erase the plan of destruction and correcting that what was once destroyed. And on the third day he rose again, the tomb was empty. What does all this mean? Well, in its simplest form, it's that Jesus won and the devil lost. I won, you won, and all of hell has lost. To God be the glory. Jesus is the gift and the answer to your dilemma. His salvation for me, His salvation for you is ours. If just only we believe. Believe. Yes, just believing. Now, in just a few moments, we're going to go back with Dr. Cajose for an intimate time of praying for your needs. But before we do, just right where you are, let us once again give ourselves to Christ. Let's make it right with Him today. And I'm going to ask that you would bow your heads and pray with me today this prayer. Dear Lord, I admit that I am a sinner. I have done many things that don't please you. I have lived my life for myself only. I am sorry and I repent. I ask you to forgive me. I believe that you died on the cross for me to save me. You did what I could not do for myself. I come to you now and ask you to take control of my life. I give it to you. From this day forward, help me to live every day for you and in a way that pleases you. I love you. Lord, and I thank you that now I will spend all eternity with you. In this I pray. Amen. Now, if you said that prayer today, welcome home. We want you to know that we're rejoicing with you. If you said that prayer today with me, please contact us by writing to us at fbwc at ymail.com. We want to share in your excitement, and we want to send you a resource to help you with your next steps in your walk with the Lord. Thank you for joining us today. Now wait patiently. Look to the heavens, for our Father draws near. Now until next time, God bless you this Resurrection Sunday. My dear friend, if this message has been a great blessing to you, 
let me urge you to sow into this ministry. To advance his kingdom, God wants to use your time, your energy, your talent, and your money. Don't let the enemy lie to you and tell you that you are useless and a failure. The devil is a liar. You are a child of God, you are blessed, and God is going to use you to spread the gospel around all the nations of the earth. Praise God. Please pray with me. Father, thank you for choosing my brother and my sister. You have set them apart for such a time as this. Today I pray that you will empower them with a fresh anointing. Equip them with wisdom and more financial resources. Let them use everything they have to advance your kingdom and spread your gospel. We thank you for all the miracles that you are going to perform through us and for us. We praise you in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. We say, amen. Amen. Dear friend, thank you for everything you do for this ministry. Thank you so much for your prayers and your offering. We really appreciate everything you do. May God continue to bless you and shine his face on your family. We love you. We'll see you next time.